Renowned actor Charlton Heston stunned audiences with his dramatic flair, both on screen and in his iconic moment at the 2000 NRA convention where he raised a rifle dramatically to his head. Though publicly celebrated, Heston concealed surprising truths about himself, truths now being unveiled by the one person who knows him best, his daughter. Join us as we delve into the untold aspects of Charlton Heston's life. Early Life Charlton Heston's early years set the stage for his later transformation into one of Hollywood's most legendary leading men. As a young boy growing up in the rural Midwest, his life centered around a profound connection to the natural world, filled with woods, lakes, and fields that kindled his imagination. Born John Charles Carter in 1924 in Wilmette, Illinois, his family later relocated to the lush countryside of St. Helen, Michigan. It was there amidst over 4,000 acres of forest that the future Moses spent his childhood exploring the landscape, his inner world awakened by the subtle wonders that only nature can impart. Accounts from the era describe the young Heston as marked by a love for nature and a relatively quiet demeanor. While other children his age socialized and engaged in rowdy games, he sought the solitary sanctuaries of the forest. Accompanied often by his father on long walks examining tracks and trees, Heston cultivated an appreciation for the quiet wisdom whispered by woods and winding creeks. However, this precious era evaporated abruptly after his parents divorced when he was 10 years old. As his mother later married a man named Chat Heston, Charlton adopted his stepfather's surname, marking the first transformation of his identity. His mother's decision to relocate back to Wilmot proved challenging, as the boy struggled to adjust not only to a new home, but also to the complex dynamics of a blended family. Feeling like a displaced stranger in school initially, Heston yearned to reinvent himself. It was during this period of adjustment that he stumbled upon his true calling after landing his first role in a school play. Spellbound by the stage, he dove passionately into this new form of expression, Acting unearthed a wellspring of creativity within the young man, providing a sense of belonging and purpose he had craved. What began as a passionate pastime soon morphed into the foundation for his meteoric rise to fame. Through theater, Heston discovered a portal to imagined worlds where he could transcend the awkwardness of adolescence and dare to become the hero he imagined. Finding love and purpose through acting. As Charlton Heston's teenage affinity for acting intensified into a vocational calling, fortuitous connections at Northwestern University nurtured his budding talent. Having secured a drama scholarship based on his small-town stage achievements, he quickly distinguished himself among his peers. Dedicating long hours to honing his craft, his professors and directors noted that, unlike other novice actors who relied chiefly on instinct, Heston approached his training with nearly fanatical studiousness. Embracing the university's rigorous performance curriculum as fuel to transform himself, he began attracting attention not only for his acting, but also his strapping athletic physique that landed him roles as a varsity football player in several campus plays. However, the theater was not the only stage upon which Heston found his life dramatically transformed during his two years at Northwestern. Cupid's proverbial arrow struck in 1947, when he first locked eyes with a student actress named Lydia Clark. Captivated instantly by the striking brunette, Heston doggedly launched an unremitting campaign to court his future wife. Regrettably, his attempts initially stumbled rather than struck a chord. Over a span of months, Lydia rebuffed the love-struck Heston multiple times as he implored her repeatedly to take a chance on him. Undeterred by her reticence, he persisted, until Lydia finally relented shortly before his graduation. With World War II accelerating during their college years, the couple realized their time together could be abruptly abbreviated by the draft. Bolstered by a new urgency, Heston penned an impassioned letter conveying the depth and persistence of his affections. To his astonishment, Lydia's written reply contained the answer he had so fervently sought. On March 14, 1944, in a small North Carolina chapel as Charlton prepared to commence his military service, the two exchanged vows to formalize their partnership in life. While the realities of wartime temporarily put their fledgling marriage on hold, 
Their love now became the linchpin, supporting them through the tumultuous events ahead. Hollywood journey begins on Broadway. As Charlton Heston returned home following his military discharge, he and Lydia now nurtured a shared dream of one day gracing theater marquees as stars of the stage and screen. However, in 1946, achieving acting fame seemed an unlikely outcome for the humble newlyweds barely scraping by in New York's bustling metropolis. Initially just thankful to be reunited, the couple struggled not only financially, but also to find acceptance into the city's fiercely competitive acting scene. With scant connections but abundant grit and talent, they spent their first year posing as nude artist models to pay the bills. Then in 1947, they pooled their savings and headed 400 miles south to try running their own theater company in Asheville, North Carolina. The ambitious endeavor predictably collapsed within months due to chronically sparse audiences and depleted funds. Although their plucky Charlotte Playhouse closed abruptly, its failure helped reignite the flame of their shared Broadway dreams. So journeying back to the chaotic streets of Manhattan in 1948, Heston possessed a newfound determination to reinvent himself as a radio, television, and stage performer. Understanding the cutthroat obstacles facing unknown actors, he deftly constructed a new persona by merging his mother's maiden name with his stepfather's surname to become Charlton Heston, breakthrough to iconic Moses. Initially, Charlton Heston's Broadway gambit yielded more struggle than success, as one small role led lackadaisically to another. However, minor theater parts kept his acting abilities and network connections until larger opportunities eventually surfaced. Following his positive critical notice playing Mark Antony in a production of Julius Caesar, CBS hired him to reprise the role for their studio's live television adaptation. This early television performance captured the imagination of prolific director Hal B. Wallace, who deemed Heston's on-screen magnetism perfect to headline Wallace's next major Hollywood film project titled Dark City. Although the 1950 movie didn't attract sizable box office cues, critics acknowledged the rookie's gritty starring performance as an amnesiac drifter marked him as leading man material. Despite underwhelming financial returns, his turn in Dark City landed squarely on the radar of the legendary director and producer Cecil B. DeMille. By 1952, DeMille was actively auditioning actors to secure his central star for The Greatest Show on Earth, an epic dramatization set within the chaotic world of the Ringling Brothers Circus. Initially hesitant about Heston, DeMille felt his Dark City character exuded too sinister a tone to fit this new picture. However, that perception shifted radically after a chance personal encounter changed the director's mind. DeMille spotted Heston saying hello on a Paramount Pictures lot one day, and something about his smile, genial energy, and imposing physique suddenly evoked a revelation. DeMille hastily commissioned portrait drawings of Heston with a beard which then conjured up startling similarities to Michelangelo's iconic Moses sculpture. This uncanny resemblance coupled with the actor's natural grace and charm prompted the famed director to cast his new discovery as the canvas carrying his next cinematic vision. This epic not only exceeded expectations, but also emerged as Paramount's highest grossing movie that year, clinching several Academy Awards, including the prestigious Best Picture accolade. Beyond its box office triumphs, Heston's lauded portrayal of the noble roughneck solidified his position as DeMille's newfound leading man muse. The painstaking effort he invested in the role truly merited every accolade. His dedication to the character transcended the ordinary. During preparation, he immersed himself in the role by diligently learning passages from the Old Testament, showcasing an extraordinary commitment to authenticity. Heston took it a step further, putting his own blood on the line to enhance the credibility of his portrayal of Moses. Choosing to play the part barefoot, he willingly endured the sharp rocks of the mountain during filming. In his perspective, this sacrifice was a small price to pay for the immortality that an iconic role could bestow. Ups and Downs of Professional Relationships Over a prolific acting career spanning more than six decades, Charlton Heston navigated a gamut of complex professional relationships ranging from deep camaraderie to periods of seething tension. Despite inevitable disagreements, 
He earned widespread peer respect for his talents, tireless work ethic, and gentlemanly on-set conduct. However, behind cinema's glamorous facade, even the easygoing Heston faced occasional co-star personality mismatches that studio pressures and inflated egos amplified into slow-burning feuds. One uneasy pairing surfaced during the production of the 1961 historical epic El Cid, starring Heston alongside Italian actress Sophia Loren, who had become one of Europe's most sought-after ladies after successes like Houseboat and Two Women. As El Cid filming commenced in Spain, creative disputes and cultural miscommunications quickly brewed resentment between the two that soon spiraled. Lauren lobbied unsuccessfully for script rewrites to expand her character's role, necessitating rescheduling around her limited availability. Requests for dialogue translations and a salary rivaling Heston's further compounded tensions. Their simmering onset friction eventually overflowed onto the screen, with Heston later admitting he avoided even making eye contact with Lauren during love scenes, preferring to gaze wistfully at the horizon instead. So hopelessly deteriorated was their rapport that Heston ultimately relied on a stand-in to pose for intimate close-ups with Lauren to bypass direct interaction. In the end, El Cid succeeded as an epic extravaganza based solely on the duo's brute acting force, not their interpersonal affinity. Yet their very public quarrel highlighted Heston's refusal to placate co-star prima donnas he felt behaved reprehensibly. Problems with Yul Brynner While filming the iconic The Ten Commandments, friction emerged behind the scenes between lead actors Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner. As the dashing Moses confronted Pharaoh Ramesses' obstinance, 6'3 Heston exuded natural dominance befitting God's chosen prophet. By contrast, Brynner, who stood at 5'8, faced a dilemma. How could he possibly loom as imposing and terrible as scripture dictated for Egypt's conceited ruler? Obsessed over not being physically diminished on screen, Brynner launched into intense weight training to sculpt his physique into one that could hopefully equal Heston's imposing presence. Castmates told of Brynner constantly slipping away between every take, dropping for push-ups, and lifting weights to maintain his self-mandated exercise regimen. While contemporary accounts characterized the rivalry as initially tense, with both lobbying for more flattering camera angles, a grudging mutual respect gradually developed. In the end, Brynner successfully built his slender frame into one boasting memorable muscle definition that pop culture would forever associate with pharaohs. And Heston gained esteem for a co-star so committed to his craft that he remade his entire body purely not to be upstaged. Years later, Heston disclosed that despite any onset of edginess, Brynner gave the best performance in the picture. While dramatic Hollywood tales often exaggerate behind-the-scenes contention between luminaries jockeying for acclaim, in this case, the reality proved even more fascinating. Two intensely competitive actors both committed so absolutely to accurately realizing larger-than-life roles that their fixation to excel redefined the possible. That their world-class performances still mesmerize today is a tribute to how skill, drive, and inspiration combined alchemically under the picture's shared spotlights. Though initially uneasy allies, as the footage immortalized their work across generations, Heston and Brynner together forged timeless cinematic glory, spotlight on personal life and marriage. Beyond popcorn accolades, Charlton Heston considered his lasting marriage to Lydia Clark as the pinnacle of his life. In an industry notorious for treating relationships as disposable as last year's scripts, Heston and Lydia defied the norm. They weathered abundant ups, navigated intermittent downs, and withstood the intense pressures of fame rendering their love story extraordinary even by Tinseltown's fickle standards. Together, they raised two children while balancing the exhilaration and exhaustion of his non-stop filming schedule. During periods of separation due to Heston's movies shooting overseas, he wrote Lydia pages of adoring prose, vowing she was both his inspirational muse and safe harbor. In turn, Lydia nurtured their emotional intimacy in a manner that sustained their bond, as his star ascended to icon status. She proved integral in weathering waves of public scrutiny over their partnership from global legions of female admirers vying for his affections. That rock-steady foundation served them well when each battled harrowing health crises that tested their character and commitment. 
Lydia recovered from breast cancer with Charlton's attentive support through every arduous stage as he took a filming hiatus without hesitation so they could tackle treatment cooperatively. Years later, when prostate cancer threatened his masculine verve, she reciprocated with equally fierce, nourishing care until he regained strength to resume enjoying life. In every circumstance, they chose to face difficulties hand in hand rather than allow outside pressures to extract them from each other. Such resilience reflected a rare depth of authenticity in a world where relationships so often proved superficial. Of his marriage, Charlton once movingly shared, I have hardly spent a day out of Lydia's sight since we were married that I didn't get love from her. For the legendary lovers, their romance embodied both passion and an uncommon perseverance. Behind the scenes revelations, beyond his larger than life movie persona of bold characters and commanding presence, some of Charlton Heston's most revealing and endearing moments happened beyond fans' sight, in glimpses of his private personality. Charlton Heston's daughter confirms what we thought all along, his children. Fraser and Holly cast insight into their dad's charming family mannerisms, hidden from his public aura of imposing power. They described a warm, funny father who told jokes, read bedtime tales, and offered a trusting ear when they sought his counsel. To them, Charlton exuded more humility, compassion, and lightheartedness behind the scenes than his typical typecast roles revealed. Instead of issuing bold proclamations like Moses at home, he gently encouraged them to pursue their passions. There existed two sides to the icon, the larger-than-life mystery man, capable of parting the Red Sea on camera through his acting sorcery, and the devoted family caretaker, full of quirky dance moves and questionable singing ability while doing household chores. In similar contrast, Associates who collaborated with Heston professionally also glimpsed nuances that sometimes surprised them. During the filming of the 1959 classic Ben-Hur, screenwriter Gore Vidal developed an interpretive backstory implying the close bond between Charlton's title character Judah Ben-Hur and his friend-turned-rival Masala had roots in an implied homosexual intimacy that later soured. Director William Wyler favored this coded subtext aware that Heston's traditional views on sexuality would likely meet this demographic undercurrent with discomfort. Thus, Weiler requested Vidal conceal the context from Charlton, allowing only Stephen Boyd, who played Masala, to tap into those nuances when portraying scenes suggesting lovers' tension. Whether or not Vidal's perspective was accurate, its very existence highlighted facets of the script's interpersonal dynamics lost on the self-described Square Heston. Just as Associates saw private dimensions at odds with Heston's public image, so too did he harbor professional secrets reminding even icons have insecurities. One milestone role whose behind-the-scenes history remained obscured for decades was his voiceover work bringing God to thunderous life in Cecil B. DeMille's classic 1956 telling of Moses' mission of freeing the Israelites in the Ten Commandments. Although Heston physically embodied Moses, his uncredited vocal performance delivered the Almighty's authoritative voice, chastising Egypt and empowering the Hebrew prophet to unleash plagues against Pharaoh Ramesses. Added a substantial anonymous acting contribution Heston himself introduced to enhance the role's scope. But it proved so powerful, even DeMille felt unsure audiences could process the revelation of sonorous Moses invoking God's voice. So the director concocted a story that an obscure English actor voiced the role, preserving the mystery for decades until revealed in a 1990s documentary. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. Holly Heston Rochelle, Charlton Heston's daughter, confirms what we thought all along. Heston was first and foremost a family man. While filming the Ten Commandments in Egypt, he kept a journal to share with his pregnant wife Lydia, who was unable to join him overseas. Their daughter Holly says it was the first time he had ever left her side since World War II. The two first met in a theater class at Northwestern and instantly knew they would marry. Their newlywed bliss was interrupted by war, which separated them while Heston served in Alaska. Though his career took off upon returning, Hollywood temptation was no match for their bond. Their 64-year marriage produced two children and an idyllic family life of reading, playing games, and watching movies together. Holly says her parents took pride in raising scandal-free kids. 
What do you think made their relationship so steadfast? Share your views on healthy, long-lasting marriages and what we can learn from couples like the Hestons. Political activism. As Charlton Heston's acting renown grew, so too did his outspoken political advocacy migrate increasingly into public consciousness. Possessing firmly held beliefs on societal issues, he consistently leveraged his celebrity as a platform to champion causes aligned with his perspectives regardless of controversy or career blowback. In 1947, while still an aspiring Broadway talent, he vocally opposed the anti-communist smear campaigns spearheaded by Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy against entertainment figures suspected of leftist allegiances. Despite a tense environment of paranoia gripping Hollywood as colleagues endured suspicion, scrutiny, and blacklisting, Heston stood prominently among the few willing to express dissent. Having witnessed fascist oppression firsthand during World War II military service, he found McCarthyism authoritarian in its demagogic persecution of ideological minorities. Concurrently, the actor formed early political alliances with Democratic leaders, including Presidents John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. In 1963, he visibly marched alongside Martin Luther King Jr. at seminal civil rights rallies, becoming among the first celebrities photographed demanding equal rights for African Americans. His controversial advocacy sparked a backlash as defenders of the Jim Crow status quo labeled such stances radical and dangerous. Yet Heston's commitment stemmed from an unflinching belief that segregation betrayed the constitutional freedoms countless soldiers had died, defending regardless of color. During the historic March on Washington, he proudly linked arms with King, Ralph Abernathy, and other prominent activists before Abraham Lincoln's memorial to dramatize that ongoing racial injustices profoundly tarnished the former president's vision of equality, evolution of beliefs and convictions. Evaluating the odyssey of Charlton Heston's political philosophy reveals not unwavering adherence to orthodoxy, but an evolving continuum of opinions anchored by a moral compass whose orientation shifted through eras. During the late 1950s and much of the 1960s, his vocal alignment with democratic leaders and impassioned advocacy for progressive civil rights advances marked him as a principled liberal by Hollywood standards. Yet, as the quagmire of Vietnam and chaos of 1960s counterculture movements triggered acute social atomization, his ideological true north gravitated increasingly rightward. By 1972, the centrist Heston found his once comfortable democratic political identity growing alien. As conservative voices gained momentum asserting that post-Watergate liberalism had proven intellectually and morally bankrupt, their traditionalist postures reasserting individualism, law order, and religious tradition appealed to his hierarchy of values now under assault. With Ronald Reagan's landslide presidential victory in 1980, Heston enthusiastically supported his administration's agenda, aimed at restoring the bedrock foundations they believed earlier radicalism had fractured. Yet contemporaries noted the actor's partisan migration points less to fickleness than fidelity towards certain ethical principles he felt transcended fashion or party. On issues like abortion or perceived threats against constitutional liberties, Heston stood upon non-negotiable conviction. Having witnessed government fallibility in McCarthyism's persecution of dissent and Vietnam policy disasters, he opposed systemic intrusions into spheres of autonomy where free choice reigned. Thus, while in the early 1960s, gun ownership carried little personal relevance, his intensifying skepticism over bureaucratic overreach eventually aligned him with Second Amendment stances he initially might have resisted. Ultimately, Heston's 1987 partisan voter registration change to Republican only formally consecrated a once unthinkable philosophical evolution. From the 1990s until his 2008 passing, the Moses icon adorned himself a consecrated culture warrior fighting to protect any besieged conservative value, from gun ownership to free religious expression to guarding against perceived tyrannies of political correctness invading campuses and culture. Bravery on and off screen, 
Courage was a defining quality both of the resolute movie protagonists Charlton Heston embodied, and his own personal metal navigating adversity with stoic principle time and again. While theatrical heroics slaying Egyptian pharaohs or racist future sheriffs earned acclaim, several of Heston's most courageous moments transpired beyond studio sets or scripts. His honorable wartime service remained a point of quiet pride, fighting fascism in World War II aerial combat sorties even after comrades and crewmates were lost to ambushes or anti-aircraft barrages. That traumatic exposure to wartime sacrifice helped forge an aura of graceful leadership under pressure that permeated his subsequent actions. Later, when global tensions again erupted in the Vietnam conflict, Heston pursued a different kind of mission to support America's soldiers. In 1965 and 1966, while filming movies, he voluntarily traveled during breaks into Southeast Asian hot zones multiple times to personally connect with troops serving their nation's most questionable war. Mindful of anxious families helplessly waiting stateside for any news of loved ones rotating through that hazardous turf, he circumvented military escorts to reach isolated field bases. Once there, Heston offered encouragement face to face while gathering names and details to follow up so he could call next of kin to share firsthand that their sons endured alive and as well as war's horrors allowed. In Heston's final years, courage acquired more intimate dimensions as both body and memory faced twin assaults from prostate cancer and Alzheimer's disease. Characteristically, he handled the news of his daunting diagnosis with stoic dignity, immediately sharing details publicly so others facing similar illnesses might draw hope from his journey. As physical mobility and mental acuity inexorably declined, he nonetheless persevered attending professional events when possible, always expressing humble gratitude for supporters' care and being thoughtful enough to interact with every admirer. Where some iconic figures zealously conceal vulnerability to preserve proud legacies, Charlton Heston's choice to reveal his personal challenges exhibited courage of a different sort. His willingness to expose frightening frailties by sharing them candidly and campaigning for increased research funding left an exemplar of everyday heroism. Derived not through cinematic fantasy but simply human frailty and grace while wrestling with life's inevitable trials, his imperfect stoicism redefined a true role model. Lasting Legacy On Hollywood in assessing Charlton Heston's monumental impact on Hollywood, quantifying his prolific output across film, theater, and television confirms both unprecedented breadth sustained over time and an uncommon versatility transcending genre constraints. Beginning with his 1950 dark drama debut in Dark City, Heston's career charted a meteoric rise toward marquee elite status cementing his celebrity. Yet the next half century saw him fluidly reinvent himself decade after decade to remain relevant even as public tastes shifted to question the archetypal male heteronormativity he personified. While initially typecast playing heroic figures as in The Ten Commandments or Ben-Hur, Heston later subverted those images via morally ambiguous personalities in touch of evil, then finally anti-heroes battling dystopian futures in Planet of the Apes and Soylent Green. Regardless of role, his sheer investment of passion imbued each performance with enough emotional authenticity to enthrall viewers, even through eras when his politics and style of acting grew unfashionable. While his Olympic athleticism and chiseled jawline nourished imposing corporeal presence, what captivated audiences was the spirit behind the facade. That intangible spark that left them feeling they were gazing into the soul of eras gone by. Beyond films, Heston also etched indelible marks across television starting from live 1950s broadcasts like Studio One through cameos at the height of his fame, on 1970s hits like The Muppet Show to his two-year stint starring on primetime soap The Colbys between 1985 to 1987. Even his return to theater roots proved illustrious, claiming a 1961 Tony Award for portraying Sir Thomas More in A Man for All Seasons. Such omnipresence across all entertainment mediums over five decades created an inescapable familiarity that left an indelible imprint on multiple generations. Like a celluloid republic unto himself, Charlton Heeson spawned an artistic legacy with few parallels. Perhaps the true singularity of Heston's cultural importance rests in how he pioneered templates of masculinity that later generations of leading actors would emulate or refute to carve their own niches. In the 1950s, his on-screen potency helped fill voids of power left by matinee cowboy heroes like John Wayne or Gary Cooper, whose own primes were fading. Through the 1960s, 
Heston kept that stylistic torch burning through historical epics like El Cid, before passing it to burgeoning stars like Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster, who tweaked its presentation for changing times. That esteemed lineage endures through contemporary heirs like Russell Crowe, channeling tough yet sensitive protagonists they can trace back through Heston's archetypes, where physicality conveyed internal strength. What Heston nurtured in his performances was accessibility, that audiences could still find resonance with outsized characters because they sensed profound humanity's pulse quickening their hearts with believable desires and struggles. That alchemy transformed static images into transcendent projections of viewers' highest imagined selves. Charlton Heston's enduring enigma, despite decades inhabiting the public eye's glare, much about the real Charlton Heston remains swathed in mystery selectively revealed through occasional glimpses beyond his preferred veneer of noble masculinity. While late interviews capture fragments about his youth or greatest generation wartime experiences, substantial gaps endure about how such events may have shaped the opinions behind his paradoxical political conversion from progressive civil rights advocate to conservative culture warrior. Understanding what factors tilled once fertile liberal soil until it yielded staunch Republican allegiance remains conjecture short of Heston's direct insight. Some posit Vietnam distress, coupled with 1960s social fragmenting, spawned fierce determination to reinforce tradition against threats of rapid change, undermined America's greatness. But absent access within his complex psyche, attempts to reconcile perceived contradictions reveal more about those analyzing than Heston himself. Perhaps the most beguiling riddle was just how literally the legendary actor embodied the epic heroes and virtuous leaders whose forms his acting sorcery summoned so consummately on stage and screen. With iron resolve, he inhabited their voices and mannerisms long enough to hijack audiences' senses before seamlessly banishing them until conjured again next performance. The totality of his skill cultivated an aura suggesting Heston the man shared righteous qualities with his legendary repertoire. Yet his closest family and friends acknowledged nuances contrasting with that symbolic presentation. They cited warmth, playfulness, and progressive passions fading from view unless sought. And they suggested hints of profound loneliness and life disappointments as all but inseparable bedfellows consecrating towering success. But in the end, despite intimations, even intimates found certainty about the authentic essence dwelling behind the curtain, perpetually elusive. Thus, as death brought final silence to the Moses actor's moving baritone, his confidants realized with melancholic astonishment that the man himself took his full truth with him, leaving fragments that could never definitively decode the whole. Like the best magic, the secret to its wonder exceeded rational understanding to become timeless. And perhaps that was the craft's highest aspiration, and the craftsman's. The greatest legends retain their power only when glazed with a touch of forever unknowable mystery about how they worked their spells over us so exquisitely. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.